This is a Dell Wise 3040 thin client. So quite a bit smaller than the last one I showed. It's got less to offer too. So we've got a headphone jack, USB 2, USB 3, two display port, two USB 2, Kiki with Ethernet, and this stupid power adapter. It's not a common size, at least not one that I could find in my collection, but it's five volt, three amps. So we're gonna see if we can hack this. So let's open this thing up. There's no screws. We just shove a flat screwdriver in here and come on. There we go. We can pull the back off. There's the metal plate. So we got lithium battery. There's an M.2 slot here for a Wi-Fi card. I think you're supposed to put the Wi-Fi antennas in these feet where the feet go. Because three of those, these pop out. Two screws to take care of these two. And still hold in by some friction. Let's give it a little bit of uh, motivation here. Get out of there. There we go. So here we have a quad core Intel Atom processor with two gigs of RAM and eight gigs of eMMC, which for 2016 was probably pretty good. Um, some of these have a dual core, so make sure you know what you're buying. So to fix this, I have a USB cord that I don't really care about. This thing needs five volts, so any USB power supply should be able to do that as long as it's big enough. So this wants five volts, three amps. You can certainly find a USB supply that'll do three amps. There we go. So this cable's got a nice braided shield and uh, let me just snip that right off. Okay, we got foil and we got four wires. Red, black, green, and white. We obviously don't care about USB data, so we're just gonna cut the green and white. And that leaves us with red and black. So now on this guy, here's the connector here. He's soldered onto the back of the board here. It's like we got three pads, two of which are going to what appears to be a ground plane. And one of them is on a larger area it's connected through a zero ohm. I'm guessing that's the that's a fuse of some sort. It's a zero on it. There's an on semi chip there that might be a power supply IC. It's connected through to this MOSFET and that diode. Yeah, so I'm thinking this pad there is our power and these two here are ground. So let's pop this connector off. We could just solder onto the back of this. But what I want to do is run this cord through the hole in the case to make it look decent. So we can see looking at this that I was right on which pad is the power and which ones are the ground. Looking at the connector, this pin goes through the center pin. Huge hole here where this connector was for a pretty small wire. To keep the wire from pulling out, I'm going to put a zip tie on it and tighten it so that it can't get pulled through the case. Okay, let's fish this guy back through. There we go. We'll put the case back on. So it's got a little wing here that's for the Kensington lock that goes down this little slot. You gotta put the front on first. It just snaps in. So we got our Linux live USB. We'll put it in the USB 2 port. Plug it in. I'm gonna boot it up. Zero bootable devices found. Okay. So to get into this BIOS, we have to press F12, not delete. 
Then we get this menu that tells us that the boot mode is e UEFI, so it cannot do both BIOS and UEFI at the same time. And as we'll find later, it actually can't do BIOS at all, depending on what firmware version you have. So the only boot options we have are the Gigabit Ethernet controller to PXC boot, or under the setup. I'm going to be honest, this is the worst BIOS utility I've ever seen. Um, so if we click on boot sequence, the only options we have here are the IPv4 or the IPv6 on the Ethernet controller. It will, this particular BIOS revision will not do a legacy BIOS boot, it'll only do a UEFI boot. And it'll only do a UEFI boot from the default UEFI file name. So the first option we have to check is USB configuration, enable USB boot support. And by doing that, we can boot from a flash drive at least, and that'll get us going. On my unit, secure boot was already disabled. Um, but you should just disable it because pretty much any Linux distribution is not going to be signed like Microsoft Windows would be. AC recovery. Mine came as power on, which means every time you plug it in, it boots up immediately. And that's honestly the best if you're going to try to use this as some sort of home server, home assistant box. Um, but if you need to change it, it's under here under power management, AC recovery. So we're going to save those settings and boot into my trusty Xubuntu USB stick. Since the clip of me doing the USB mod, I since took it back apart and shortened the USB lead to half as long as it was, which should reduce the voltage drop a lot. I was having problems with it resetting, and I calculated that with the wire I use, which is 28 gauge, the voltage drop would be around 0.8 volts, which I think is enough to cause it to reboot. It was rebooting on me. So web browsing. So this is a simple website. There's no JavaScript. Scrolls fine. And I know you're going to ask about web video because you always do. Okay, so at 480p, it's able to play just fine. How about full screen? So we're dropping frames here at 1080p60. So this is not a 1080p60 box. Can it do 720 though? It looks like it can do 720. So all seven of the frames are dropped while it was transitioning. It seems like it's seems like it's doing okay now. It's not a great web browsing experience, but if you had to, it could do it. Uh, it's definitely better than something like a Raspberry Pi 3. So when this box came to me, it was completely wiped. So it's possible that it was used for ThinOS or something like that in the past, or it could have been PXC booted. The drive shows up as an MMC device. So it's eMMC, it's not SATA. So how about we install Home Assistant on this thing? Because that's probably a use case a lot of you are going to buy this for. It's cheaper than a Raspberry Pi 4. Probably more powerful. Certainly easier to find. Not going to buy a Raspberry Pi 4 now and lead times are out over a year. So I'm following the same process I used in my Home Assistant on a Thin Client video. And so I won't walk you through this whole thing again. But basically, we're running a live USB of Ubuntu, or ex-Ubuntu, and on the live USB we're going to run Belena Etcher and tell it to write the Home Assistant OS image to the internal memory. So it was able to finish successfully. Now Ubuntu's trying to open all the new file systems that got written. All the HassOS stuff. So we're going to reboot into HassOS, and I'm just going to make sure it works. And I'm not going to show you quite as much, because it's I've shown you guys this kind of stuff before. Looks like Home Assistant is launching just fine. So this can run Home Assistant. So I was able to successfully install Xubuntu as well as Home Assistant OS onto the system. But when I tried Debian, I got this error. It says no bootable device is found. So I'm going to reboot into setup. So there's a bug in the UEFI on this system where if the bootloader is not at the standard location, it will not boot. Yeah, so Ubuntu doesn't exist anymore, but it doesn't know that. Debian here, we view the options. 
it it thinks the file name is an EFI boot boot x64 dot EFI, and that's the UEFI fallback path, where if the UEFI doesn't know what the file name should be, it looks for this file name on the EFI boot partition. So anytime you have an EFI system booting from removable media where it hasn't configured the UEFI with its name and things like that, you'll get it'll go to this path. And so Ubuntu and Home Assistant both put their bootloader grub into the EFI boot, boot x64 at EFI. But Debian did not, and it's supposed to be able to configure the UEFI and tell it where the boot, where the boot path should be. But for some reason, the UEFI on this Dell 3040 uh, does not like that. So to fix this, we're going to launch into the Debian installer in rescue mode. So I'm holding down F12 so I can get to the boot menu. Come on. Come on. There we go. So we're going to choose the Debian installer again. Rescue mode. So now it's asking us what the root file system is. And in this case, it should be MMC block 0 P1, because P0 is our EFI partition. So this one should be root. Yes, we're going to mount the boot EFI partition. So force grub installation to the EFI removal media pass. Yeah, so it says right here, some EFI implementations are buggy, and this one sure is. So we're going to say yes, and it's going to fix our grub install so we can boot. So now we should come up into Debian. And here we go, Debian GNU Linux. I needed this system to run Debian, so it's like a Raspberry Pi for video I'm making. So you guys get to follow along in my struggles of getting it to boot on this 3040. Hope you enjoyed this overview of the Dell Wise 3040. It's definitely not as good of a thin client as my 5060s over here, but those were quite a good deal, and they're not always available for that price. This is consistently available for under 40 bucks. It's not too hard to do the USB mod, and it works as a great x86 home server with built-in memory and storage. What more could you really ask for for something of this size?